Hey folks, today I want to show you how Noah Bacalny does this. So this is a really cool solo and I want to tell you all about it. But first, do me a huge favor and subscribe to this channel and like this video. The more people do that, the easier it is for me to spend a lot of time making these videos, which I love doing. And if you want the tablature for everything in this lesson, as well as the tablature for all of my other lessons, then you should head to patreon.com slash Eli Gilbert Banjo. That's where I post all the tablature and bonus practice tips, live streams, all kinds of stuff that you can't find here on YouTube. And stick around to the end of the video to find out how you could win some free banjo strings. Anyway, I took this solo from a video of Noam Pekelny at a jam session, and I'll leave a link in the description if you want to watch Noam play it. Obviously, there's a lot going on here, and just learning this solo is a really great way to expand your knowledge of the fretboard. But we can also look at each technique that we come across and find different ways to explore and practice these concepts. So let's go measure by measure and talk about everything that Gnome's doing here, as well as different ways to practice these ideas. Okay, so in the pickup and the first two measures, we've got some fairly basic Scruggs material, which roughly outlines the melody. It's nothing too complicated, but it's a great way to set up your solo, especially if you're going to spend the rest of your solo improvising like Gnome does. You can learn this type of language by learning solos from Earl Scruggs or J.D. Crow or Sonny Osborne, really anyone that fits into the traditional bluegrass banjo category. Measures three and four is where things start to get interesting. And what makes them interesting is that it does contain the melody to Blue Ridge Cabin Home, but it's somewhat obscured by syncopation. And syncopation really just means that the melody notes or accented notes occur on offbeats. Here's the melody of those two bars as they're usually played. If you line up the tablature for both of these versions, then you'll notice that the melody in Gnome's version comes early, hence the syncopation. If we put some of these notes late, then we'll have our own syncopated version of the melody. As you can see, our new syncopated melody has all the melody notes, but it's actually harder to hear the melody in the midst of everything that we're playing. So when you play with syncopation, you're gonna have to find a balance between rhythmic interest and a cohesive melody. And if you're looking for some more playing with syncopation, then check out my Don Reno videos, which often include a lot of syncopation based on the forward roll. Measures five and six are spent climbing the major scale, alternating fretted notes with the open fifth string. And if you're familiar with the single string shapes from my single strings lesson, then you can use those positions combined with the alternating fifth string to create this sound. Another way to do this is to combine the fretted notes from the single string shapes with roll patterns. In measure seven, we see something really common in gnomes playing, and that's a triplet or a quarter note and two sixteenth notes descending across three strings. And we'll talk about that more when he uses it again later in the solo, but for now he's connecting that to a melodic scale passage that you'll recognize if you've seen my mega melodic scale lesson. Measures eight through 10 are made up of sixths, either in a roll pattern or alternating with a fifth string. And if you wanna learn more about that, then you can check out my sixths lesson. But in this case, Gnome is using sixths in a really interesting way. Even though we're in the key of A, he's playing sixths in the key of D. He's doing this because the D major scale contains a G and the A major scale contains a G sharp. So if he uses the D major scale over an A chord, then it effectively creates the A7 sound. And you can learn more about seventh chords by checking out my seventh chord lesson, but the effect that this have is that it pulls the A chord, the one chord, towards the D chord, which is the four chord. 
So in this passage, wherever you see the note G, that's what's creating that A7 sound that pulls us towards the four chord where he lands. And this isn't just for sixths, this also works for single string shapes or melodic shapes. If you play the major scale of the four chord over the one chord, you'll turn the one chord into a dominant seventh chord. And if you're familiar with modes, then you can think about this as the Mixolydian mode. Measure 11 is made up of a C position lick. And it doesn't seem completely improvised. This might just be a lick that Gnome plays in the C position. But if you want to expand on this, then you can try playing the same right hand pattern, but doing something different in the left hand. In measure 12, we have a double stop in thirds. And in this case, Gnome only plays one set of thirds. But if we want to expand on this, then we can move up and down the scale in thirds. And if we use these thirds alternating with the fourth string, then we can create some licks reminiscent of the things that maybe J.D. Crow or Sonny Osborne would play. In measure 14, we see the return of the material from measure seven. So now we know that Gnome really likes to use this to get into a melodic scale shape. So here are a few different places you can go once you get into that melodic shape. And then finally, Gnome ends the solo with some more classic Scruggs material. So as you can see, there are a lot of things that you can learn from this relatively short solo. If you wanted to incorporate these sounds into your playing, then you'd probably want to familiarize yourself with melodic scales, single string scales, sixths, thirds, as well as all the classic Scruggs language. And I'm sure that Gnome learned these techniques from all the players that came before him. And what's great is once you familiarize yourself with some of the sounds that came before you, you get to put your own stamp on it, which Gnome has clearly done here. And it does take time to learn all this material, but there's no rush. It's still just one foot in front of the other, like anything else that we're gonna practice. And even if you don't end up using any of these techniques, I hope you at least see the process of breaking down and analyzing something so that you can learn from it and get better. Anyway, I hope you found this useful, and if you stuck around this long, then I bet you're wondering how you could win some free banjo strings. And it's easy. Assuming you're already subscribed to this channel and you've liked this video, all you have to do is comment below with what your favorite technique from this solo was. And congratulations to Andrew, who is the winner of last week's string giveaway. So if you want to be a winner like Andrew, then don't forget to subscribe and like and comment below. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.